Amazing that as well known as the Dead Sea Scrolls are, relatively few people have any idea of what's in them. Basically, we can break down the contents of the scrolls into a few categories. We have scripture, hymns, ordinances and laws, apocrypha and pseudepigrapha, along with a few miscellaneous texts. Aside from this unique cache of biblical books, there are also a significant number of commentaries on the Bible. The people of Qumran were especially interested in prophecy and what is called eschatology, a word referring to the end of the world. We can guess that for that reason, there were commentaries on several of the prophetic books of the Hebrew Bible. But these commentaries are very much unlike the books of scripture they're based on. It's important to point out that the Bible, as a series of books, is what we would call today a pretty good read. In other words, it's straightforward, clear, and concise. It is, for the most part, fairly easy to understand. The language of the Bible doesn't mince words. It tells it like it is and allows the reader to take it as it is, to accept it or reject it. It hides nothing and obscures nothing. With the possible exception of certain prophetic passages, such as Daniel and Ezekiel, it is truly an open book. The commentaries of the Dead Sea Scrolls, by contrast, are obscure and convoluted. In sharp contrast with the clear and flowing Hebrew of the Bible, they are, most often, a jumble of tangled words and bizarre terms and expressions which make little of any sense even to the scholar or the master of the Hebrew language. Not only are these commentaries not clear, it seems as if they were deliberately written to confuse outsiders, that is, anyone who was not a member of the Qumran sect. Therefore, it is extremely difficult to translate these Dead Sea commentaries, as well as the other sectarian literature, into English and anyone who compares various popular English translations of the Dead Sea Scrolls will notice immediately that the translations vary widely on almost every line. How do you know then that you are reading an accurate translation? The answer is, Watson, nobody knows. You may simply take your pick, but we need to get acquainted with a number of important literary characters who are introduced in the commentaries. Though again, there is much discussion about who they are and how to understand them. In addition to the teacher of righteousness, there is the wicked priest, the man of the lie or man of falsehood, the preacher of the lie, and the house of Absalom, a group who should have helped the teacher but kept silent. And throughout all of this material is the idea that the members of the sect are chosen. They alone are the elect. Hercule Poirot here of Agatha Christie fame. A good detective must investigate which exact commentaries we are referring to. There is, for example, the Habakkuk Commentary, a series of cryptic ramblings on the biblical book of Habakkuk. It's especially difficult reading since so few people are familiar with the book of Habakkuk in the first place. 
Habakkuk is a thin book in the Hebrew Bible, which speaks of the impending doom of the ancient Israelite kingdom as it was about to be gobbled up by the powerful Babylonian Empire. The prophet bemoans the sins of the people which have brought about this catastrophe. But he concludes that whatever is to be the national fate of Israel, the thing to do is to be faithful on a personal level. He makes the classic statement, Ki hineni mekim et akasdim, hagoi hamar vahanimhar, pashru al hakitiim, asher hema kalim vegiborim bemilchama. The doom that the prophet sees is imminent and involves actual historical events, the impending destruction of the nation by a foreign power. This is where good detective work is required, because the Dead Sea Habakkuk commentary, by contrast, is more an apocalyptic work regarding the end of days than a straightforward explanation of what the biblical book is all about. In fact, the word apocalypse, a term akin to eschatology, comes from a Greek root meaning that which is revealed and well describes what the Dead Sea Scrolls are all about. Classically, the Habakkuk commentary cites a brief passage from the biblical book, followed by a cryptic portion, which is all but written in a sort of code. It declares, Beshom am et kol habaot al hador ha'aharon mi pi ha'kohen asher natan el belibo bina Livshor et kol divrei avdav hanavim. As with all the Dead Sea commentaries, the passage begins with what the biblical prophet actually wrote, but then reinterprets the message to say, this is what he really meant. In this case, the sectarian writer refers back to a prophet who lived more than six centuries earlier Yet he is convinced that the same prophet is actually speaking of the Qumran sect, not the national fate of Israel. The enemies of the Qumran sect, whoever they are, have rejected the Torah. It seems, in fact, that the cult of Qumran was so exclusive that virtually everyone who was not a member of their own small group was an enemy, one of the sons of darkness. But these same enemies have come against a strange mystical character, apparently the founder of the sect, called the Teacher of Righteousness. A few lines later, the commentary quotes another interesting passage from the prophet Habakkuk 1.6. Ki hineni mekim et akasdim, hagoi hamar vahanimhar, Pashru al hakitim, asher hema kalim vegiburim bemilchama. In a strange sort of code, the writer here insists that while Habakkuk wrote of the Babylonians, the powerful enemy that destroyed ancient Judea in the year 586 BCE, he was really speaking of a group called the Kitim who have never been identified beyond doubt by modern scholars. The most likely possibility is that these Kitim were in fact the Romans, who ultimately conquered and subdued the territory of Judea under the general Pompey in the year 66 BCE. Interestingly, it is the Romans, the Kitim, who likely brought about the final end of the sect in the year 68 CE, when they put down the great Jewish revolt, which later ended on the rocky fortress known as Masada. The Qumran text comments on Habakkuk 1.5, which references the nations called upon to be astonished at the work God is going to do, although they will not believe, though it be told. According to the Dead Sea sect, these are the unfaithful ones who have not heeded the words spoken by the teacher of righteousness from God's own mouth and who refused to believe. The teacher of righteousness was believed to have understood the course of future history through divine revelation. 
Citing Habakkuk 2.1, the Qumran writer declares that God commanded the prophet to write the things that were coming on the last generation. But Habakkuk was not informed when the final epoch would come to an end. When Habakkuk writes, Leman Yarutz Korevo, it is understood as a reference to the teacher of righteousness to whom has been revealed all the mysteries of the words of his servants, the prophets. In other words, the messages given to the biblical prophets remained shrouded as mysteries, razim, beyond the understanding of the prophets themselves. Their interpretation, or pesher, had finally been revealed to the teacher who transmitted them to his followers. The famous words of Habakkuk 2.4 read, but they were understood as follows. We are told, however, that at the hands of the wicked priest, the teacher of righteousness and the men of his council suffered iniquity. The Qumran commentary relates, Pashru al hakohen harasha, asher radaf achar more hatzedek, levalo bekaas hamato, abit galuto, uveketz moed menuchat yom hakipurim, hofia elehem, it has been theorized that the teacher followed a different calendar from that of the Jerusalem priesthood. Consequently, the teacher was slain on what would have been Yom Kippur for the Dead Sea sect. He would have been weakened by fasting and unable to defend himself. But the wicked priest who observed Yom Kippur on a different day would have been unaffected by its restrictions. We read in the biblical text of Habakkuk 1.13, Lama tabitu bogdim v'tachrish bevala rasha tzadik mimenu. The Qumran text declares, Elsewhere, the Qumran text refers to Habakkuk 1.5, declaring, Pesher hadavar al habogdim im ish hakazav, ki lo ha'eminu b'divre more hatzedaka, is the man of the lie the same as the wicked priest? Most likely he is someone else. And who are the traitors of the new covenant? Perhaps the same as the house of Absalom, who were either intimidated or apathetic, failing to defend the teacher. Such questions are only the tip of the proverbial iceberg among contemporary researchers of the scrolls. The successor of Jonathan the Maccabee, who some scholars identify as the wicked priest, is his brother Simon, who acts as de facto high priest and king. As far as the sect is concerned, he perpetuates the evil begun by Jonathan, stealing the high priesthood from those who should rightfully hold it, the family of Tzadok. The overseer of the community calls them the last priests of Jerusalem. The scrolls contain the frightful prophecies about their fate. Kohane Yerushalayim ha'achronim asher yikbotsu hon Uvatsa mishlal ha'amim, ulachrit ha'yamim, yinaten honam, im shlalam, beyad chel hakitim. Another Dead Sea commentary on a biblical book is the 
Nahum or Nahum commentary, so named after the Israelite prophet of the seventh century BCE, who foretold the doom of Nineveh, the capital city of ancient Assyria. The brief Qumran scroll begins, Go'er bayam v'yabshehu pashru hayam hem kol hakitim l'asot bahem mishpat u'lekalotam me'al p'ne ha'aretz. The ancient prophet is obviously speaking of the majesty and power that accompany God, but the Qumran writer pushes it to the end of days, comparing the clouds to the convulsion of heaven and earth, which in the mind of the cult will soon take place when he, God, comes down. The Qumran sect clearly believed that the end of the world was near at hand, and they saw the troubles of the present days as nothing but birth pangs, the messianic tribulation which would usher in a better day. Theirs was an apocalyptic view of the world, dominated by the notion that their generation was undoubtedly the last. Some of the same ideas are certainly found in early Christianity, being echoed in the book of Revelation. But the important thing to learn from the scrolls is that these ideas of an impending time of tribulation followed by God's glorious appearance before all humanity are not a unique aspect of a totally new faith, Christianity. They were present in the fabric of Judaism all along as represented by the scrolls themselves. Elsewhere, the commentary on Nehom speaks of We are reminded of the flavor of the New Testament epistle of Paul to Timothy, which declares, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, slanderous, without self-control lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. We have nothing to do with them. Sec Thus, the New Testament language could simply be reflecting patterns of speech common to the commentary on Nahum. Among the Qumran fragments are other brief commentaries on several other minor prophets, all echoing similar themes. The Hosea commentary, for example, speaks of the Lion of Wrath, or the furious young lion. Might this be Alexander Yanai, the cruel Hasmonean king responsible for the slaughtering of the Pharisees who revolted against him? It relates Importantly, we also have a commentary on the most well-known and most quoted of all the prophets of Israel, Isaiah. In it, we read, Od hayom b'nov la'amod, yenofef yado har batzion, giv'at Yerushalayim, titgam la'achrit hayamim lavo, moshel ha'kahal, ba'aloto mibikat ako lelachem. The original reference is to the king of Assyria, but the new reference is to the leader of the Kittim, clearly the Romans. Again, there is a fixation on the end of days and a coming apocalyptic war to be led by a mighty righteous ruler. Interestingly, in line from the plain of Akko is the ancient city of Megiddo, from which the name Armageddon is derived. Hine ha'adon Hashem tzvaot mesaef po'ura b'ma'aratza v'rame ha'koma geduim v'hagvohim yishpelu pashru al hakitim asher yichtu bet Israel v'anve Yehuda. Again, we find reference to the Kittim, apparently the Romans, who in the eyes of the sect faced defeat at the hands of the righteous Israelites. 
elsewhere we find reference to a messianic figure who will come to the rescue at the end of time. Yamit Rasha, Bahayat Sedik, Ezor Matnav, Bahemuna Ezor Khalatsav, Pashru Al Semach David, Haomed Baacharit Hayamim. Nonetheless, the commentary speaks of the men of mockery who have rejected the law of God, along with the seekers after smooth things who are in Jerusalem. Among the Qumran fragments are other brief commentaries on several other of the minor prophets, all echoing similar themes. The Hosea commentary, for example, speaks of the Lion of Wrath or the Furious Young Lion, might this be Alexander Yanai, the cruel Hasmonean king responsible for slaughtering the Pharisees who revolted against him? It relates, Pashru al Kohen ha'acharon asher yishlach yado lahakot be'efraim. There is also a commentary on the prophet Micah, commenting on Micah 1.5, which asks, and what? Is the high place of Judah, it declares, Pashru al more hat sedik, asher hua yore hatora la atzato. Referring to Micah 1 6, which speaks of a place for planting vineyards, it declares, Pashru al metif hakazav, asher hu yat e et hapetaim. Is this the same as the man of the lie? And is he identical with the wicked priest or is he someone else? Not surprisingly, there remains vigorous debate about every aspect of these writings. Who produced them and under what circumstances? In general, however, we can see them as a rich source for our understanding of what this strange sect believed and how they lived their lives in their secluded settlement established in their minds on the very edge of eternity.